Welcome to Think Tech on OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Zuri Bender. In our show this time, we'll meet a New York architect and landscape architect, Susanna Drake, who visited Hawaii just last week. We'll hear about her special form of creativity and the project she's been working on in New York and maybe someday in Hawaii. A few weeks ago, we interviewed Scott Wilson, architect and former chair of AIA Honolulu. Anything you can imagine you can do That's with true. modern engineering and architecture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the world is on a roll here. You know, last yeah. time we talked about public spaces, that's an important global, uh, you know, movement, if you will. Mm -hmm. But then this new aesthetic, that's also an important global movement. Yeah. And it improves the quality of our lives, I think. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about that. In a very big way, it seems like the world has almost leapfrogged us. Um, um, it seems, I, I, I really try, you know, ascribe a lot of these new creative forms. You see buildings that are just massive curves. There's not a single straight face on them. They're angular, they're curving, they're swooping, they're, they're offset, like you said. The, the creativity is partly, in fact, because of, I think, the 3D uh, CAD software that everybody has now. I mean, yeah. you, architects can visualize um, forms that we never could even dream of in the past. They can do walkthroughs inside and outside, uh, flyovers, uh, um, and they can mold, you know, volumes uh, in, in incredible ways. And, and uh, someone like Frank Gehry is, is the guy that, you know, we know of in, in America, and he's brilliant. Um, there's no question that, you know, he could only do that because he's using this, arc, this aircraft software that he, he got, from, he got uh, from, from aircraft manufacturers. But uh, when I look at the... Uh, uh, some projects that are over in, in unusual places like Azerbaijan or Dubai or, or you know even uh, East A Europe or Africa, Asia, particularly China, uh, I'm just thinking, wow, uh, American architecture has is almost stayed uh, by comparison. What drives them to do this? Well, um, no question. I uh, you know my in my opinion. Uh, a lot of city leaders want want to grab want a headline grabber. They want they want a they want an icon. The way Bill Bow built that that's been 30 years already. But uh, so many people saw the effect of the Bill Bow Museum and what it did for a sleepy little post-industrial city in 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 a remote corner of Spain. And uh, I think uh, particularly uh, cities in China, they they are trying to distinguish themselves and. Uh, Every, you know, uh, any municipal leader uh, uh, with vision is just thinking, how can I build something that will really grab the attention of the public? Shame on us. This building is, is in Milan, Italy, and not exactly a tropical climate, but uh, this is called the Vertical Forest. And, and this, uh, this architect, whose name is uh, Stefano Boeri, um, decided he wanted to help clean the air. Uh, the, you know, obviously the air in, in Milan is pretty uh, polluted. It's an industrial so city. So he created a forest in a high rise. And so each of these units has a big old planter. You can see those boxes, those are concrete boxes and they've got trees, full on yeah. trees. There's yeah. something like 900 trees in these two towers. Then we learned about Susanna Drake. She's a well-trained architect and landscape architect with a small architectural firm in Brooklyn, New York. Her firm, D-Land Studio, has only 10 employees, but has worked on a great many innovative national and international projects.
Susanna Drake is dedicated to the design of public parks and spaces and to creating green spaces that make cities more livable. She's also dedicated to altruism, public service, and the common good. Before she founded her firm in 2005, she worked for architects and landscape architects in New York, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Wyoming, and California. Her exposure to diverse ecosystems, population densities, and scales of operation enhanced her vision of what makes a particular place truly special. Her firm integrates planning, programming, and design, and has been a leader and collaborator in large teams of design professionals. It creates projects on a conceptual basis, drawn from a sense of place, the client, the function, and today's construction technology. The firm's projects in New York include the Gowanus Canal Sponge Park, a public space designed to absorb and remediate stormwater, the Brooklyn Bridge Pop-Up Park, a temporary waterfront open space that attracted 200,000 visitors over three months in 2008, and security for the NYPD headquarters in Manhattan. The firm's international work includes the Raising Malawi Academy for Girls outside of Lilongwe, and a 1,200-acre public park and resort development in Abuja, Nigeria. Two weeks ago, we had the benefit of Susanna Drake's company. She came to present remarks at the School of Architecture at UH Manoa. Her talk was entitled, The Creation of 21st Century Public Infrastructures, Beauty, Economics, Politics, and Ecology. ThinkTech invited her to join us in our studio for a talk show interview. When you think about some of the great landscapes in urban settings, um, you know, parks like, um, like Central Park come to mind, or um, you think of some of the great waterfronts right across the United States, um, and really, you know, the the inclusion of open space in cities is is sort of fundamental to the way they work, and I think there's been a greater recognition of that uh, in recent years. Although, even in New York, with the landscapes of Robert Moses that are sort of notoriously about cars, mm -hmm. he also um, created a lot of parks and playgrounds and um, and parkways that actually did add a lot of green space to the city. So I'm actually working on a lot of those kinds of landscapes, those infrastructure projects that, you know, maybe had a, uh, a, a thread of green within them in the early sort of imagination, and that green may not have ultimately reached fruition in the construction. So. It's not about value engineering, it's about human value engineering. It is, and I think it's about providing um, really public amenity to, to people and to communities that um, really need the resources. Yeah. So I try to really help underserved uh, communities that have been kind of put upon by these infrastructure systems that are running through cities. Tell us about your firm, tell us about your staff, tell us about your clientele. Well. Um, I do a lot of public work. I do some private work. Um, but I would say the work that I'm most known for uh, really has to do with, um, again, thinking about infrastructure, thinking about how we have these linear rights of way that run through our cities, like the train lines and the highway lines and um, these spaces that weren't necessarily intended to be about sort of urban occupation. They're really intended to move cars, move people. So what I'm doing is going in and saying, OK, urban space is too expensive to, and too valuable to have it only devoted to a transportation use. So we should really be thinking about the value of that space and how we can improve it by really layering on additional programs. And whether that is by you know, putting a cap over a highway trench to build new, uh, new park space, recreation space for an underserved community, or um, building underneath an elevated rail line, for instance, um, to enable sort of new public functions or new light industrial functions. Park Avenue, Park is, Avenue. Over the, is over the trains. Exactly. Uh, what a great idea that was. It could have been trains right out there in, in public. It <laughs> really is a great idea and, you know, was a great idea and um, facilitated a phenomenal amount of real estate development that's yeah. some of the most valuable real estate in New York City. Yeah. New York, it really is way ahead on this, isn't it? And when I think, okay, well. Yes, <laughs> no, it is. We'll, it is. we'll yeah. examine how far <laughs> ahead it might be. We are. <clears throat> well. At least it's sensitive to the issues. Right. And there are people in New York who are you know, going to demand that there be green open spaces. But what about, and I just came back from New York and went mm -hmm. to see a play. Uh, we went to see, of course, the, the High Line. 
Okay. Which is okay. Like, like one of the eighth, it's the eighth wonder of the world or something. <laughs> what do well, you think of the High Line? Uh, the High Line is a really beautiful um, landscape that's very well crafted. Um, it was exciting to p see so much um, public money go into a park, right? And it was also so exciting to see so many different uh, sort of um, agencies and factions within the city also get behind mm -hmm. a piece of, uh, of public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was also, um, you know, it's been a, a sort of phenomenal sort of tourist phenomena. Uh, you know, it's, it's a landmark, a new landscape landmark for the city. When you talk about coming to New York City, you might have, might have said, you know, where are you going to go? Oh, Central Park. Like, er Central mm -hmm. Park is on everyone's yeah, list. Yeah. And now, like, the mm -hmm. High Line is on everyone's list, and Central Park is on everyone's list, right? Yeah, and, yeah. you know, then there's, the, mm -hmm. of course, the Met and MoMA and, you know, a lot of other um, important uh, institutions. But it's, it's really um, just a great thing. That's one of the wonderful mm -hmm. things about public parks uh, is that they bring people together around the common enjoyment of either the place, the atmosphere, the nature, the landscape, mm -hmm. or some kind of programming such as soccer. So it, it's an exciting um, and it's a social addition. Thing. It's, a social it's social, thing. It's, exactly. It's not one person. It's all the people who come and what happens between them in this special place. Exactly, and it's not about this. Like, it's not, sorry, this is the fake <laughs> iPhone here, um, right? No, it's not about know. this. It's about, like, communicating with people, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what park mm -hmm. space is all about. And people want to be with other people. Architects and certainly landscape architects are, in fact, artists. And our cities are their canvases. And every artist needs a patron that is a landowner, developer, or government that wants to leave its mark for the world to see and enjoy. When the patron leaves the design to the artist, the result can be amazing. And there are so many amazing projects being built around the world today. So many glorious opportunities for architects to achieve unprecedented levels of function and design and to leave their mark and their gift to us in ways never before possible. Sorry. But this kind of amazing doesn't happen very much in Hawaii. Land is expensive, so our owners and developers must spend more on land and less on creative design. They ask design professionals to keep costs down with what they call value engineering and to avoid creative risk taking. The result, with few exceptions, is a city without great design in its buildings, infrastructure or public parks and spaces. Susanna Drake pushes the envelope of creativity. She's come up with a wide array of design innovations in her work in New York and elsewhere. And innovations like that could be great for Hawaii too. She returned to New York shortly after our talk show. But she said she likes Hawaii and wants to return. Serendipitously, one of the principals in her firm is from Hawaii. They hope to be able to design projects here. And it seems clear that they should, for their benefit and for ours. We welcome Susanna Drake to the future of our city. We want her to look things over, give us her reactions, and take on some projects here. We need her kind of altruistic imperative to make our city human and livable. Yes, we want her to come back and give us the spark of what she has done elsewhere. We want her to contribute her art to ours, not only on specific projects, but on the way we as a unique society interact with our irreplaceable environment. 
Want to know more about Susanna Drake and her firm and their work in New York and around the world? Check it out at dlandstudio.com. Now let's take a look at our ThinkTech calendar of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from noon to 5 p.m. on weekday afternoons, and then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long. And some people listen to them all night long. If you missed a show or you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on ThinkTechHawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to ThinkTechHawaii.com slash radio. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and our live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, sign on to our email list and get the daily docket of our upcoming shows. ThinkTech has a high-tech video studio at Pioneer Plaza. We invite you to come down, see our studio, and be part of our live audience. Contact me, Jay, at thinktechhawaii.com. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube, or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We want to know what you're thinking and how you feel about current issues and events affecting Hawaii. We want you to stay in touch with us, and we want to stay in touch with you. Let's think together. <laughs> On March 17th, ThinkTech, in conjunction with Grassroot Institute, will present a downtown forum lunch and panel program to explore ways by which the Native Hawaiian community can reach its cultural, social, and economic goals, other than by political sovereignty. Our program is called Beyond Political Sovereignty, Pathways for Hawaiian Advancement. Join us and raise your awareness about the critical changes affecting and taking place in Hawaii. Be a part of the conversation and sign up to attend on thinktechhawaii.com. Want to speak out about a community issue or event? You can. ThinkTech invites you to come down to our studio and make a video at our speaker's corner. If you'd like to express yourself, contact me, Jay, at thinktechhawaii.com. And now, here's this week's ThinkTech commentary. Today I'm talking about Apple versus the United States government. I disagree with Apple, and I agree with Dianne Feinstein and even Donald Trump that Tim Cook of Apple is wrong to fight with the FBI and the federal government about whether Apple should comply with the court order that requires it to help the FBI get access to the data on Saeed Farouk's iPhone. 
It's not for patriotism that I disagree with him. It's for practicality. Apple is still an American company, and in fact, the richest company in the world. It has developed remarkable technology and has deployed it with great success. Apple used to program backdoor access to the iPhone. Now they would rather fight to preserve their new mobile encryption. This new policy sounds very noble, but we also have a wave of terrorism in this country. And those terrorists are relying on Apple's technology. Now terrorists can pull out their iPhones and send encrypted messages around the world. For the price of an iPhone, they can command and control assets from Syria to San Bernardino to do brutal killings in our country. This empowers terrorists everywhere and gives them a huge advantage against us. Is that what we want? The consequences are far too great to ignore the problem. We have to do what we can to find and stop them. It's a balance between encryption and national security. That's simple. Most people would give up this level of encryption if it meant saving lives. Who exactly is Apple protecting? Some say Apple is just protecting its market share. The court's ruling requires Apple to provide the FBI with an update to bypass a feature that automatically erases the data on the phone after 10 incorrect attempts at logging in. That would allow the government to make additional attempts to log in itself and extract the data. The order does not require any change in Apple's encryption system. Tim Cook, however, says that the order requires Apple to leave the keys to these devices, quote, out in the open. But that's a gross overstatement. This is not a backdoor or a slippery slope. The order only deals with the login password on this one phone. At the core of it, Cook is really saying that we can't trust the FBI or the federal government to limit its use of the bypass to this one phone. But that's really unjustified and unfair. To technology observers, this order is the most efficient way to solve the problem and only requires a minimal effort by Apple. In fact, there may be no other way. Apple has not denied any of this. The court gave Apple five days to object if compliance would be, quote, unreasonably burdensome, end quote. Since all Apple has to do is add some zeros to the number 10 in the code, the order doesn't seem very burdensome at all. It's not as if the order is arbitrary. It's based on a hearing and a finding of probable cause that this phone was used by one of the terrorists who killed 14 people, and it can help us identify who else was responsible. So this is not a Fourth Amendment question. It's a question only of whether the federal court can order Apple to help the FBI under the All Writs Act of 1789. I think it does. Let us not forget that Apple itself designed the phone and the encryption. Isn't Apple the best, if not the only one, to do the bypass? Would Apple want the government to make a futile attempt to rewrite its operating system? Terrorists are using these phones to kill people. Does Apple have no responsibility to help us deprive terrorists of that tool? Sure, we haven't been happy with the Patriot Act intrusions since 9-11, but this was not a secret intrusion. It was on motion and hearing in open court where Apple made and lost the argument. Do we loathe the government so much that we would deprive it of this data? It's not Apple that is the underdog here, it's the government, us, that's the underdog. To me, Tim Cook is just grandstanding, trying to look like a hero and improve Apple's market share, as if Apple needs a bigger market share. By convincing us to love and admire Apple more than other cell phone companies who are not doing media campaigns calling for the privacy of the little guy, whether we really need or care about that level of privacy or not. Fight all he wants with the enormous resources he has available to turn the public against the government. This is not a matter of public opinion. It's a matter of law. And the law is that the district court has the power to issue this order. For Apple to refuse to comply undermines the government's ability to protect us from the greatest threat we have ever known. The reality is that these attacks aren't over. There will be more. Regardless of Apple's campaign, we will need to protect ourselves from those who would indiscriminately murder our citizens. For that, we're going to have to have the government find out who the terrorists are and what they're doing, within constitutional limits, of course. 
Otherwise, their terror will terrorize us all. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Zuri, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. It's been fun. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Zuri does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech on OC16, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a volunteer, a producer, or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and globalism in Hawaii. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Zuri Bender. Aloha, everyone. Oh, oh.